Ken. <laughs> Our second sort of angel of the evening is Ken, who's going to tell us some tips on astroimaging. Well, yeah. So it's, Which would be just wonderful, actually. Yeah, my apologies <laughs> first for standing in front of you and telling Dave Gabine, because those who know Dave Gabine, because a fantastic talk, those who don't know Dave Gabine are present. It's just, it's just great. He's very casual and very relaxed and very laid back. And very and, knowledgeable. Uh, but, oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> he wouldn't tell you he's a Dundee boy. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. So, he's got well, a long accent. Was warm at the it's good, yeah. It's nice. <laughs> <laughs> the idea behind this fill in was that at the members' night, I was going to show a five minute little section of my recent star imaging uh, because I've been so pleased with what I've got. But I've part of that a little bit to give you some background mm -hmm. to what I've been doing. You've seen the image I've been taking in the past mm -hmm. year or two, and I've changed my tack a bit on this. And I thought I'd let you see the pictures from January, December, January to February that I've been taking with a different tack on imaging. But I thought, well, let's lead in to this a bit, because I've got a 10 minutes to the 5 minutes, and I've said it's a long struggle for astro images. It's been a long struggle for me for astro images. I started messing about with cameras. Now, cameras have changed in my lifetime somewhat. <laughs> <laughs> Digital photography is magic. Digital SLRs. You go back to film SLRs. But when I started, there weren't film SLRs. There wasn't 35mm cameras. There was 128 on on a little Bellows camera back in the 50s that I started. So this would be a revolution for me, an eye-opener. There were difficulties, I'm not going to go into the difficulties that I met trying to get this telescope here, which now decides they can do a loft still, does it? So that's that's your own one, isn't it? Ah, that's my that's own your own one. Well, it's standing on my upstairs landing at the moment, ah, it's needing, it, needing its mirror re-silvered. Well, the society's old 8 inch one is in my loft. Oh right, oh. okay, okay. Anyway, Henry, I, I, I started uh, observing way back in the 50s and I was observing with a, a £4.76 2 inch stop down non achromatic refractor about that long and about that size. <laughs> <laughs> and I was actually looking at planets and the moon. I became interested in the moon, visually observing the moon is fabulous. It's great. It still is. I still love it. But you could do it with a small telescope. In my small telescope you could see bands, two or three bands on Jupiter. You could see the rings of Saturn. Faint objects, I had a go at brighter ones like Messier 42, Orion Nebula, have a look at M31, the Andromeda Galaxy. You could see fuzzy things through this tiny telescope. Anyway, over the years, uh, I was never really very keen, I'll be frank with you, about fuzzy little galaxies that you could hardly see. I'd love to have photographed them. All I saw in these days were pictures in Encyclopedia, all taken with 100 and 200 inch telescopes. Yeah. And these were wonderful, these, these galaxies and these nebulae. And that was my introduction to these. But you couldn't possibly <coughs> see them, nor could you possibly photograph way back in these days. Then along came the early 70s and I decided to build the observatory in the back garden. And I decided on a very big telescope at the time. In these days, a six inch reflector was a big telescope. An eight and a half, like this, was a giant telescope. In these days, the bigger the telescope, the better. That's not necessarily true nowadays because of what you can do with digital imaging. But in these days, nice big telescope. I was really keen to photograph the moon. I was really keen to have a go at some of the fainter objects, or the brighter fainter objects, shall we say. And to that end, I got a four inch Franks, that's a Franks four inch reflector, as a guide scope. So, the first thing I tried before this telescope was my old one and a half inch, was putting the camera onto the end to try and get a picture. This was back in 58. <coughs> To try and get a picture of the moon. So out the lights, Graham, please. 
So the first picture I remember taking is I could see something on the moon by sticking a camera on the end of this little telescope propped up on the old coal bunker outside. <laughs> What's this? And there you go. I've actually got barrier, dark mm -hmm. markings on the moon. And I was, I was enthralled by the fact I'd got something. I'd actually got an image of the moon with my telescope. Mm -hmm. Now that's 1958, April the 3rd. <laughs> I actually got the date there. First successful, call it successful. That's of course the, the eyepiece boundaries there, that's not the edge of the moon. So, way back in the, it must have been some years later, 1970, 70, 71, I decided to go for the big telescope. And here it is, and there I am looking Who's through. Who's the young man there? Who's that <laughs> young man, yeah. yeah. This is what I used to guide when I found a, a, an object. The problem was really immense. Trying to photograph bright things like the Orion Nebula or the Andromeda Galaxy. Focus, as we said recently, is everything. When you're taking photographs with a telescope or with anything, focus is critical. We've now got pattern of masks, wonderful things. Just look in front of the telescope, you've got this grid that gives you a diffraction rating with an X, and a light that goes between them, and you just line it up in the middle, and it's spot on. It's absolutely spot on. Visually, it's very difficult. What we would do with this, I do it for the moon and for stars, is to put a mask in front of the telescope with two holes in it. And what you would do is focus it so as the two holes came together, they'd overlap, and you could bring them back to, to the point where they were centralised. There's a name for it, I forget what it is. Anybody remember that? Uh, Hartman. Hartman, yeah. And I used that all the time to focus. It worked quite well, but not nearly so, much so well as the Batonoff masks nowadays. So what I would do is for the moon, I'd go and focus on a star, because the moon tends to wobble about quite a bit, so I'd focus on a star with this, then back to the moon, but the moon was easy to get back to, because it's bright and big. You get back to it without taking the camera off your telescope, get back to it, find the moon, then with the focus, you focus on the star, click away happily. So that's all I would do for that. But for nebulae, it was very difficult, because you just could not see these things in your camera, ground glass screen. Mm -hmm. So you try and focus on the star and try and find your nebula again. You weren't sure if you'd got it or not. So it's a real pain. Now with Go2, mm -hmm. if you've got your camera, your, your, sorry, your telescope set up accurately and three star aligned, you can just dial in your object and it will go pretty well to it. Take a test picture, see if it's just off centre, centre it up and you're there. So things are so much easier these days. Now occasionally I did get a bit of help. <laughs> <laughs> my, my daughter did not, never take to, this, to, to astronomy. She would, um, I think she, all, all she got out was unpots. That was sunspots. <laughs> unpots. I'd show these projected sunspots. Unpots. So here's the observatory I have in my back garden. That was it with an eight and a half inch um, reflector. It since has undergone dry or wet rock, so the whole thing fell apart basically. But, but that was, a, a, as you see, a brick structure. And this was made by my father-in-law at Lord Roberts Workshops in Dundee. Remember the disabled right. ex, um, ex war ex service of people? And he made this for me. And I had little wheels from hospital, a strange hospital casters. <laughs> and they were put into the wall with the two bricks upright and the little wheels in between the little stainless steel um, axles. And the whole thing were drawn round and was kept in place by this little skirt. So it was it worked quite well actually. Yeah. <laughs> that was my observatory. Anyway, back to You see back the problems of trying to build a round structure with flat bricks. <laughs> yes, yes. It's quite difficult. Quite difficult. The problem with photography then was that in the, in the days when we were now back in, we now to DS, uh, sorry, single lens reflex cameras, 35 millimeter, but we're dealing with film. Days of film, mm -hmm. what do we choose? In the earliest days, we were dealing with 50 ISO, up to maybe 400 ISO, black and white, tri-X, 
uh, high speed ectochrome colours film, 125 ISO, wow, that was really fast. So you, the problem was the faster you went with your film, the coarser the grain. There was no way around that. So I use a fine film for the moon and the planets like Pan F, nice and fine, but needed longer exposures because it's a slower film. For deeper sky work, I used Tri-X, but it was still pretty grainy and horrible. So it was a struggle to know what to use. Slow to keep the grain down, fast to keep the exposure time down. This, of course, had been all kind of sorted out with digital. So the 8-inch telescope was super for the moon, and you could get reasonable pictures of the moon with the 8-inch telescope. Quite successful. Um, next one just shows the sort of thing I was getting with the 8-inch, which is pretty good. I was quite pleased with that. Now, these images magnified up with eyepiece projection would be of about two second exposure. Now, if you've ever looked through a telescope, you'll know that the moon will wobble considerably in two seconds. So, there's a certain amount of blurring, no matter how well you focused it, a certain amount of blurring that you would get because of the atmospheric conditions. The best image, one of the best images I got, I'll show you next, and I'll show you how I learned the moon. I learned it by photography, but by observation, but also by photography. I observed the moon, but you can't in the dark have a book and say, oh, what crater is that? Oh, I can't, oh, can't see a damn thing. So what I did was take pictures. That's one of the best pictures I took with the 8 inch. And it, that's back in about 1975. So it's an old, an old picture on Pan Air film. And what I would then go is inside, and I'd draw a rough diagram of all the craters I saw and name them. And that's how I learned the moon over the years. So I've got whole books of these diagrams showing the pictures I took and the, and the craters. I've forgotten half the craters of the moon. I, I actually learned way back then. But that's how I learned how, how, about the moon's surface. So we come to, that's the moon. That was relatively easy. There were all the snapshots, just about, not like nowadays. There are snapshots nowadays. Take your camera on the end of a telescope, give it. Take your phone on the end of a telescope, give it a click. You'll get a picture. It'll be good. It'll be better than that. But one night in August 1975, our honorary president phoned me up excitedly. It must have been about the 30th, 29th of August. Cameron Dinwiddie. No, no, our only president. No, it wasn't. No, another president currently. Currently. Oh, oh, right. David Green. David Green on the phone. Yeah. He said, go and look at Cygnus. I said, what, Dave? What's all about Cygnus? <coughs> go and look at it. Go and look at it. Okay, okay, right, right. So I went out. And there, I'll just show you the pattern. There's Cygnus there. There's Deneb. And there's the, the stars of the cross of Cygnus. And this bright star above Cygnus made it look really weird. And that was Nova Cygni V1500, the 31st of August. So star fields work quite well, but what I did with the telescope was to set the drive going, stick a camera, piggyback on it, and let it expose for a minute or whatever, two minutes, whatever it happened to be. And that's how we got this sort of picture of the of Nova Cygni, it was published in one of Martin Moberly's books mm -hmm. way back then. Um, there, there it is there, that's actually taken from the internet showing where it was, the great Nova Cygni at the time. That was brilliant, it was magnitude one-ish, it was quite bright. <coughs> it made look really weird. It's amazing how one star, mm, as bright as that, made Cygnus look strange. Yeah. It's really strange. Deep sky objects, the brighter nebulae, I would have a go at. I would try, I would persevere, and I didn't get great results, but I got something. And for these days, 1970s, it was okay. That's about the best picture I got of Messi 42, the Ryan Nebula. So I was quite pleased because I got something of a nebulous mm -hmm. object there. And uh, Andromeda Galaxy M31 had a go at that. And that's about the best image I got. You can just about see the dark lanes. Now, think of this. These pictures there were taken guiding with a homemade guide eyepiece 
using fibre optics and a piece of perspex put at the focal plane with engraving with a scalpel, which I could then light up and follow the star with my little handset, which was pretty close by present day standards. And I was guiding for between 20 minutes and 40 minutes wow. <laughs> to get a picture, a single image of a faint object. So you see why it was tedious and even the brightest were possible, but the fainter objects were just not possible. Mm -hmm. I would have loved to have got these fainter objects. Recent developments, well, thinking about the digital cameras coming in in the, the 90s, <coughs> and at the time I thought, no, I'm not going to digital. Colours film is far better quality. And under digital in these days was sort of three megapixels or something mm -hmm. like that. Maybe five was a really high level of, of resolution. Mm -hmm. I thought, no, I can do better with the colour film. I kept on for a, for a while. But gradually the cameras got better and better and better. And then DSLRs came out uh, in the, the 2000s. They were quite, quite readily available. And so, moving on to DSLRs. And a go-to telescope. Now, this was, this was uh, originally Tony's uh, setup. Well, not the telescope, but the actual mountain, which I, I got from Tony some time ago. Uh, this here. And this is the setup I use now for my astrophotography. I first of all use the refractor, a four inch, no, it's a five inch Tony, wasn't it? Right? No refractor. Did I give you a refractor as well? A five inch. Why would have been a four inch? Was it a five inch? Oh, it's a five. Four inch maybe. Anyway, I used that and I got terribly blue halos around bright stars. So I thought, okay, let's change to a reflector. Newtonian reflectors probably a good idea because you do it with this colour problem and the only problem you've got is, is coma around about the edge of the film so I put a coma corrector on the camera and that's working quite well. Let's go to once you set up and you'll see what I've done. I have to put little blobs of paint on the patio area so I don't fold this down I just carry it into the garage. There's a wonder, it's quite heavy, plonk it down but I want to go out, just carry it out again, line up the legs, and it's usually with the polar telescope through the middle here. There's some sort of Something in the other. Like that. Now, here's work in progress. Here's what I've been working on for a while. Uh, I thought, okay, let's push my luck. There's a thing called the Horsehead Nebula, and it's a dark nebula against a very faintly illuminated background. It's really faint, everything's faint. I thought, let's have a go. So I set the telescope on that. I couldn't see anything. So I just let it go. And it's at the top of the picture here. The flame nebula is the brightest. That's Aldatak, isn't it? Am I right? Mm -hmm. Left hand star of Orion. Left hand belt one left is not the target. Yeah. It's just in the way. It's a damn nuisance. <laughs> it's too bright. It's too close to the nebulae. There's nothing more nebulosity here. That's. Um, that's NGC 2024, I think, that one. And the horse head just got it. I thought, yes, I've got it at last. After all these, these um, years of pushing, I could get that. So, where do we go from here? Oh, yes, that's, that's the two faint nebulae. By the 28th of January this year, improvement. More images, just more images, more, more, more images. And you see the faint light in the back. It is a faint glow here. Mm -hmm. Alnatak's really bright. There's no way of shielding yourself from that. But you can see the horse head. And I was just amazed to actually get that. So a little telescope like that. So that was one of... It can be improved yet. It can be improved yet. <laughs> uh, next year, not now, it's a bit too late now. But the trouble is Orion and uh, these Gabby's nebulae just pass above the street light opposite. So we're not at the height. <coughs> right above that street light, which is really annoying. I can't do anything about it. Oh, yes, right. you can. <laughs> 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 so we move on again. Back to um, our M8182. I think that's an improvement yeah, with more, image, more images. Again, more images from about 20, 25 to 40. I'm getting more and more images. There's not too much in the way of granularity, but even with a 3200 ISO, so that's not bad. You can see the active nuclear parts here in M82. 
So I'm quite pleased with that. Another picture, 31st of January, M101. Again, you see the spot of arms coming out nicely there. There's M101. That's just at the handle of the plough. If you look at the handle of the plough coming down and look left, uh, left, no, yes, leftwards. The plough pulls the right, right one, 51. It's, it's face on, so it's upright. If you get Galaxy's edge on, they're much brighter. Well, this one is face on and it's come up amazingly well. And that was a day, I think, was that day when it's high? I can't remember, it's there until 2 or 3 in the morning. I don't think it's there until 2 or 3 in the morning to get the objects high up. Sorry, which, what's the name of that one again? That's uh, the name of it. It's M101, but it's yeah. called the uh, Pinwheel. Pin pinwheel. 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 Yeah. Pinwheel. Yeah. Pinwheel. Pinwheel. Yeah. 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 Yeah. They've got fancy names. Uh, I've had a try on the, was it the same day. Yeah, 31st. Yeah. That's yeah. the bubble nebula. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Mm. And you just about see the bubble. Mm -hmm. That's only a planetary nebula. Now, that's a, that was a tough one. You see how many stars there are? In Cassiopeia, it's up in Cassiopeia, so lots and lots of stars, uh, lots of exposures, and careful processing. You see that gaseous material down here, you can actually put just about. That's another one for next year, but it's high up to try to improve. I'm try to improve every, every time I take pictures. Some nice clusters, the Owl cluster, MGC 457, nice cluster. And now, uh, for February, last month, I got hold of an Altair uh, camera, one of these little things that just slip into the eyepiece. And I hadn't used it to any extent before, so I stuck it first of all, it's a very, very steady night this particular night. Mm. I stuck it onto a 102, that's only a 4 inch Maksutov, it's about that length, and rattled off 1500 frames. It's an SER file, not an AVI file, on that particular mm -hmm. camera, which is apparently a better format. So I've, I've processed that and auto stack it. This is again Alan's suggestion. I used to use Registack for the whole lot. It's much better, as Alan said, to use auto stack it and then refine the actual final image on Registacks. It works really well. There you go. And you've got Amazing. domes there. See the domes of Arago? Two mm -hmm. domes of Arago. Aye, it shows the shadows of the back to front for the locators. Yep, yep. <coughs> it's nice, isn't it? Yeah. You see the ripples in the, the Maria. Yeah, it's just on the terminator. It looks almost three dimensional. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, I'm really pleased with that camera. I need to do the next, the moon coming up next few days. I'll be trying that again. Mm. In fact, it'd be nice to try it in our own 12 inch. I'd love to stick that camera in a 12 inch and see what we're getting. So the moon is still with the moon. The bigger the aperture, the better. The more resolution you'll get. That's the one place it does still count planets and the moon. Just one or two more of um, the moon. That was on the 12th of February. It's really, I'm really quite impressed with that little camera. You see the tiny little craters all over the place, little tiny things. There's the Alpine Valley, mm -hmm. quite clearly seen. What my aim with the Alpine Valley is, maybe with our own 12 inch, maybe with my 8 inch, I don't know. But with the right illumination, that's just a bit, a bit too early. When the Terminator's about here, we might just get the drill down the middle. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm aiming for. I've got certain things I want to do. I want to try and get that rule down the middle of the Alpine Valley. I need a bit more magnification. That's just taking the prime focus. Uh -huh. I put in a, a bar though, at least, yeah. and see what happens. Yeah. So that's that one. And then we've got this area here, Archimedes, Autolysis and Aristillus. Lovely area with the Apennines and the Alps. And if you know your Apollos, folks, Hadley Rill, not quite, you can just about see the edge of Hadley Rill. It's actually just in the shadow there a bit. So another, if the terminate was about there, I should be able to get into that shadow there. And if things were stable, that's my next thing, is to get the Hadley Rill with the, with the 8 inch. Certainly with the 12 inch, should manage it. But the pictures I'm getting with that camera are good. I'm really quite pleased. Then I went out one night. A week ago or so, 
And I thought it was nice and clear, got all the gears set up, and looked around and thought, hey, wait, wait, what's going on? These LED lights are showing <laughs> the, 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 the beam downwards with a faint foggy haze. And, oh, no. Oh, I've got all set. So I went ahead and tried something. And that night I got, I got three or four things I hadn't got before. I'd hoped to get better results. Messi 108 in Ursa Major, Messi 109 Ursa Major. I got the Owl Nebula in 97 by chance. It's just, it's in with M108. It's just about here. What a disappointment it all must have been. I <laughs> <laughs> And then, then they got M, got M51. I see a friend, they got a couple of satellites going across. Would well, you believe that? Oh, yes. <laughs> Would you believe right beside it? So that was a, a poor night, but I thought I'd try something. Um, then I was messing about recently with gradients. And this had a bit of a gradient on it. This is that's actually the one with M eight one oh eight. It was that night with the mistiness. And a bit of a gradient, M one oh eight, you see how regular irregular like galaxies, and there's the owl nebula up there, and there was a bad gradient, that was in a dark area, and the gradient sort of came around by here. That was dark and that was lighter. And this gradient production would work quite well. So I'm quite pleased to work on that a bit more. The same night, rather nice picture of M51 came out. Again, um, it's worked quite well. That was March the 4th, that was on Monday past. That was Monday past. So that was the last night I was out. Monday past, I got M51, uh, M101, quite nice. Again, it shows the spar alarms quite nicely. They've come out really quite well. And what I did get on Monday night for the first time was I waited till half past one a.m. and the Leo was, was as high as it's going to get. Mm -hmm. I hadn't taken the Leo galaxies, but right above that stupid street light again, because <laughs> Orion had gone that way, I thought I must try and get some of the galaxies in Leo because they're all over the place. And at last I got the Leo triplet, <laughs> the Leo triplet, nice. 1065, 66. NGC 3628. You see the dust lane, the NGC 3628. So that, I was very pleased with that. So that's brought you up to date. That's up to Monday past. Um, there's my final. Improvements take time. 50, 60 years. <laughs> 50, 60 years. A lot of 50, 60 years left to try and prove this, but they're doing away quite nicely. Uh, what we need is more nights, and I hope we can get some more nights even before the end of the, the month, because that's when the clocks change and yeah. things get much later and later and later. Anyways, folks, um, I've enjoyed this because it's really working for me, and it's been making me very excited to get these results after all these years. Uh, so, have a go. Thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs>
do ten, go and have a cup of tea, that's what I do. So I go off and have a, a hot soup in the greenhouse, turn the heater on, and wait for the camera to click away, and then off to get something else. So it's, it's yeah. been a revelation for me from the early, from the late 50s, to find I can do this, because these pictures I'm seeing here, I was seeing when I was a young lad, pictures like that, in books, taken by the 102 inch, 200 inch telescopes. Mm. And here's me being able to take similar pictures. Wow, yeah. isn't that amazing? <laughs> anyway. There's also been this vast change though in free software. Yeah, well, yes. It's just become oh. stunning. The free software, like uh, Autostack or to Registax, is fantastic. And these people have made that available to, yes. to, to general use. It's just unbelievable. Um, Might be affected by Brexit. <laughs> I've got it. I've got it. <laughs> I think we'll still be able to download stuff. <laughs> Just use a VPN. It's uh, a thought, though, my <laughs> Rush home and stand out. Yeah, stop by the sound. Uh, strength and the weakness yeah. of the web, of course, is there are no weaknesses. There are ways around such things. <laughs> Ken, they're just fantastic. Are there any other comments or questions for Ken? Ken, yeah. you were using longer exposures, you said up to three minutes. Yeah. Were you still, I mean, you were using what, 800 ISO when you were doing that? Yeah, four, four sometimes four fills, sometimes eight, maximum eight. Right. But again, I was realising that the drive on the, tel on the, the telescope, on the, the, the amount, was not up to it. Right. So, in these days I was taking maybe up to 10 images to stack, yeah. but then I find that three of these would be unusual. Yeah. But having cut down to less than a minute, it's driving, as you see, pretty well yeah. perfectly all the time. I pretty well pinpoint every star, I'm really pleased. Mm -hmm. So down to 40, 50 seconds, up to a minute, minutes of maximum I'm using. But 3,200 for most, apart from star clusters and globulars, yeah. which are Quite intense. They, they yeah. can cut around 800 or 1200 ISO, but for faint objects, 3200. I never would have thought I'd use that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. You never even thought you'd be able to get ISO. No, <laughs> that's what they have. the films as well. You can tell what the camera can use. Yeah. 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 150 ISO, 200. You see, I, I thought at one point, I thought at one point of putting on a, an auto guider which would correct the wanderings of the mountain, but I thought, well, that's daft because living in an area, an urban area with street lighting, to increase my exposure, my exposure time is just going to gather more street lighting. So it's a compromise between trying to keep down the street lighting, process it out, use lots of imaging, shorter exposures and higher ISO, and that seems to be working. That's my ethos is, is winter, and it's working. Yeah, yeah. It's working for me. Is there not a maximum number of exposures that you can stack? Yeah. I would have thought it would saturate the picture if you had too many. No, no, it doesn't no, saturate no. it. It doesn't saturate it. But the actual um, cutting down of the noise becomes less and less and less the more you take. Right. So they say, I think, it's nine, you, you reduce it by a third, but by yeah, it's a square, 25, square, 30, it's... Probably it's square, so, the square so is. 30 or 40, more than that, it's probably hardly worth it. But it's really the noise reduction rather than the, the exposure. Yeah. But that's a big that was a big deal yeah. in the old days. The noise was the grain in the film. I'm still thinking of film. Well, yeah, <laughs> well, that's, that's what I've had image. to overcome. Yeah. I've had the to overcome. The individual it. image, I suppose, is overexposed. Well, it's it's washed out. Then overexposing it more is going to wash it out more. Mm. You see what I mean? It's mm. going to get a bigger white spot. Mm. Yeah. Would you keep all your images within the, oh, I don't know, I can't the word, the capability of the, of the, the detector. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. sure. But the faint objects are well within that. And once you've taken them, you can do what you like. You can oh, yes. Use them or oh, not. yes. You can process them all. It's <laughs> something that impressed me greatly, Ken, is yes. particularly your picture of M33 mm -hmm. and also. Uh, it looks obviously a picture of M101, is the extent of these galaxies. Yes. Uh, yes. So you, you see the bit you're familiar with, the bit oh. taken by the 100 and 200 inch, the yes. right bit in the middle. Yes. But you can see that it extends twice as far away yes. again. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. So these galaxies yeah, are huge. They are. Well, that's a whole, that's a, a full frame of prime focus. So it's taking yeah. the whole frame. But some of these other galaxies I'm taking, like um, 
81, 82 and so on, they're just small. You won't get any bigger unless you get a bigger telescope. The bigger the telescope, the, more, the bigger the focal length, the more accurate the try has got to be. Mm. And potentially, the slower the telescope will be anyway, unless you have a big, huge thing at f4, which is going to cost you a fortune. Mm. You need a huge mounting, so there's a limit to what you can do. So there's all the issues about uh, the, the, the bigger your lens or your mirror, the better your resolution. Basic physics. Yeah, but that works mainly for planetary and lunar. It doesn't work quite... The resolution is important for face fuzzy objects. Take your point. Mm -hmm. You're either talking about mm -hmm. diffuse extended mm -hmm. objects yeah, yeah, yeah. or a point source it where neither of these issues matter. That's why the 12 inch we've got down at Hutton I want to try and use for the moon and planets because that's yeah, got the resolution which I can't get. We need, need that, that... We saw the moon with a 4 inch. That was pretty good. What am I going to get with the 12 inch? Thin grills and so on will be. The paradox is that we need the better instruments for the objects that are closest to us. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Any other comments or questions for Ken? In that case, we can just thank you again, Ken, for having us.